Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself to everybody. Uh, I'm Alan Merrick, a team member at Modi Sports, and we're extremely pleased to present this remote soccer summit uh, with ideas on soccer, soccer education, and remote learning. Uh, my, my first introduction is, is of Skip. Uh, it's my immense pleasure to introduce the Chief Executive Officer of US Youth Sport, Skip Gilbert. Uh, with over 2.6 million registered players, USYS is the largest youth sports organization in the USA. Skip has served in leadership roles with a number of Olympic organizations over the course of his career, including the US Anti-Doping Agency, the United States Tennis Association, USA Triathlon, USA Swimming, and USA and US Soccer. He was elected chairman of both the National Governing Bodies Council and the Association of Chief Executives of Sport. Um, that's really impressive, Skip. Um, Skip's passion for the sport extends beyond the professional experience. Uh, he played soccer for the Tampa Bay Rowdies of the North American Soccer League. He was on the US Olympic Development Team. He trained with Sheffield United in England and other clubs in Holland and Hong Kong. He's a licensed soccer coach and member of the University of Vermont and Lawrenceville School Athletic Hall of Fame. Please welcome Skip Gilbert. Uh, the microphone is all yours, Skip, as you speak to coaching and the lifelong pursuit of learning. Welcome. Thank you, Alan. Um, certainly appreciate that. And you know, I, I, I'd be remiss in saying I, I'm, I'm just captivated by the picture behind you. You know, seeing the great Pele, you know, there. I think I can't tell if he's wearing his Cosmos jersey or not, but he uh, is actually. Yeah. Is he? You know, what a what a watershed moment for for soccer in this country when Pele came in and said, "I'm going to play in the U.S." Yep. And so, but at any rate, thank you very much for for having me here. Um, certainly, my coaching credentials can't come anywhere close to the comparison with the panel that you've assembled for this. So I, I, I'm going to stay away from the, the X's and O's, but I'm going to go into you know, the dynamics of, of what coaching really means to not just the players, but the, the entire spectrum of the constituents of, uh, of the sport and really across all sports. So from that standpoint, I'm going to introduce a, a video and, and Brandon, before you start, when I think of coaching and most of us think of coaching that, you know, we get the players prepared for what they're going to do on the field of play. And that we expect that when they get to you know, play, if they go through the youth system and then they go into college and then they hopefully they play professionally or they play for the national team. <laughs> And they keep going, you know, down their path. And at some point, you know, they, they rely less, we think, on coaches. But the reality is that we never do. And I'm going to share a, a Twitter video that when the first time I saw it, um, Tom Condone from our staff sent it to me, you see two of the greatest players in golf history and just I'll, I'll just go ahead and play it, and I'll, I'll comment afterwards. But this is Gary Player and Jack Nichols. Nicholas, sorry. That's way inside. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. <laughs> it was a really nice hit. Yeah. I'm jealous. So if I get, I think I like the shoulder to it because that gets me. Well, you don't think you're shoulder, just get your, get your shoulder back behind the ball. Yeah, you know, every one of them perfect. <laughs> but now, Jordy shows me a picture of my swing. It used to be right there, man. Now you see it. Yeah. Uh, well, you're, you're why, why, does, why does that happen? I mean, all right, I'm older, but I go why? Back, I go back to Oakmont, 62, when I went to US Open, my back swing was right there. Oh, Are you sure of that? Yeah, sure. And then, and, and then I go back and watch another swing. Two, year, uh, two years later, it's here. Then I watch one two weeks later, it's there. Why? Huh? Why? You swing different. Jeremy, you want to swing longer? Okay, put the ball down. I know I'm hitting the ball so well, I don't like they're changing a lot. You know, it's fine. I need to swing one here. Want to make a longer swing? Yeah. You know, what are you going to do with these golf balls? Just going to pick them up. <laughs> Tell me when you're ready. Don't lose these ones. I'll 
you do that, you yeah. come here, and then yes. you come here. It helps you, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It sure is all good. Hey, Johnny! Move to the right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be the man that killed Johnny Morris. <laughs> it's okay. That, I love that. You see, I would try. That feels like Which way you do? All right, Brandon, you can cut it there. One of the things that I like so much about that video is it, it shows you, you never stop coaching, you never stop learning. And so from my perspective, sitting in the seat with US Youth Soccer and, and Alan Kindly, you know, all the players that come through our system, all of the coaches that, that, that work within our system, is the, the ability to manage the expectations and what you do every day has an impact on someone's entire life. And so from our perspective, it's not so much just the X's and O's, it's really the impact that you're having on the players. And I, and I often talk when I talk to coaches, you know, what are you trying to get out of it? And the reality is if you talk to any player at any point in their career and say, who's your best coach? Chances are any player that's played the game for a while and instantly will be able to give you the names. For me, you know, I could go George Seymour and he was a coach that I had back in New Jersey. And nine times out of 10, when you start to drill down as to what did that coach provide the player? For me, sure, it was X's and O's and, and, and working on my skills and my ability to be able to read the game, play the game. But the reality is that coach helped me become the person that I am today. And so it was more of the off-field support or guidance, if you will, that that coach was able to instill. And so when I speak with coaches and when I, when I talk within our staff, you know, it's really we want to instill for all of our coaches that it's not just what you're able to do and success on the field, but realistically, 20 years from now, when, you're, when your players are asked if you, you know, who are or who was their best coach, your name wants to be in their, you know, right at the tip of their tongue. And it comes down to managing expectations. And what we've seen over the last year with the pandemic is that's thrown a huge curveball into everything that we're thinking about from a coaching dynamic. And again, I'm not going to sit here and talk about, you know, how you should be able to best connect with the players if you're working, if you're coaching remote, but it's how do you manage the, can, the, the expectations of those players? And, and for us, you, you look back at what USYS, we changed our vision at the beginning of the year to bring communities together through the power of soccer to make lifelong fans of the game. And re, re, you know, again, reality dictates we want kids to play, but we want them to be fans of the game so that they stay connected with the sport so that when they're as old as I am, they still get a thrill of everything that happens within the sport. You watch the professional matches, you go out, you buy gear, you proudly wear it, but you're part of the game. And I use this in an analogy, you know, we've got a long way to go in this country. Uh, every February, 100 million people will sit around and watch the Super Bowl. And I would bet that a good number of those people the morning of have no idea the name of the teams that are playing. But it's the Super Bowl, it's February, and, and the whole country comes together. We want that to happen with MLS, NWSL, USL, the World Cup. We want that kind of passion and commitment to be there. And so from a coaching perspective, we'd love to see coaches be able to take that step and not just help players you know, become the best on the field and become the best character off the field, but truly become fans of the game. And so from that holistic approach, it enables, you know, that pendulum to move where we are a country of just kids that play soccer to we are a country that lives and breathes for soccer. And Alan had mentioned, you know, I, I have a, a fondness, right? I trained years ago back with Sheffield United. And that was a time before Americans crossed the pond. It was very rare um, that, that we were able to go over there and do anything, in, in, especially in England. 
But was fascinating for me, you know, outside of in the locker room, people actually, because all they could see of the United States was what they saw on TV, you know, and asked if I carry a, you know, a gun. Um, but the reality was, what really impressed me was in Sheffield, the tone of the city the days after the matches, the fact that if Sheffield United lost the match, there was just, it was, it just was, there was that, you lost that excitement. And, and what was really exciting was when Sheffield United and Sheffield Wednesday came together and whew, that was a lot of fun. But the point being is we want to get that same ethic in this country and we can't do it without the help of our coaches. That ethic has to come. So from a remote learning, you know, sure, you want to get the kids to be able to touch the ball perhaps not juggle or dive across their couches in, you know, in, their, in their living room, but get them to watch the game, get them to see and, and, and how do they dissect what they see. And again, how do, can they talk about the sport outside of just their playing capabilities and their teammates capabilities, but to be able to embrace the sport. And I think if we're able to come out of that pandemic uh, and, and get to the point where all of our states are playing. We're back with our national championships. We've got, you know, our ODP programs running at full speed. You know, when we can get there, the state cup competitions, you know, we want the players, you know, to, to, to just take the sport and run with it. So from that standpoint, you know, again, what, what the pandemic has kind of taught us is managing expectations and without question, make it fun, you know, and I'm sure you're all in, again, you're going to hear from people that are a lot more versed on coaching X's and O's than I am. Um, but again, it's got to be fun. It's got to be practical. And you've got to be able to manage the expectations of kids that, you know, I can't imagine, quite frankly, being a kid today. Um, and we're seeing the mental health repercussions um, are, are rather significant. As a matter of fact, we're going to be launching next year um, something called USYS University. And within that university concept is going to be a health care curriculum so that players can recognize when they're struggling. Teammates can recognize when their teammates are struggling. Parent coaches and parents can recognize all of those signs so that when kids are struggling because they don't have the life as they you know, had two years ago, we can help them through it. So, you know, from my standpoint, that's that was really my message is managing expectations, make it fun and try to instill that lifelong fan connection to our sport. And if you do all three of those, you will be in 20 years from now, those kids that you coach are going to say that was my best coach. So, Alan, I'm, I'm going to take a, a pause there. I'm more than happy to answer the questions. Uh, we'll go from there. Uh, great, great insight, Skip. And uh, uh, really interesting about the, 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 the new university that you're putting together. Um, having to do some adjustments here with, uh, with, with the screens. Um, this was a question that came from Jeremy in New Jersey. Uh, and he said, what the pandemic did was it froze our lives. Um, I, I had to be proactive in connecting and reconnecting with soccer buddies when the lockdown began. It, uh, it has proven to be very beneficial to distance meet and knock the ball around with buddies. Uh, that's helped me deal with loneliness and the lack of relationships and interactions. How are others people managing uh, any insights? And so, it, it will be perhaps if, if you've got a little bit more about the university and perhaps the 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 help that is going to be generated from that that would be superb to listen to sure and and again those are you know what he had mentioned you know that discussion is being played out in every community around the world um, and again you know for, as we launch this university <laughs> concept which will have programming in there to to connect with mental health uh, we will have one segment that is uh, character de development. You know, I talked about that earlier on, you know, all of the things from nutrition to, you know, again, you know, becoming a leader, working with your teammates, being vocal, supportive, you know, all of the things that we want to see, not just on the field of play, 
but certainly when you get into school, when you get into the business world, you know, when you're when you're a leader in your community, all of those things um, that aren't necessarily to be meant on, to be acted on on the side. It's all to be part of the vernacular of coaches and parents. And then the third part is we're working with one of the the world's top um, surgical hospitals. Um, they're connected through FIFA, but they're going to create a muscular skeletal health and wellness uh, uh, platform, if you will, that, again, as we come back from the pandemic, one of the dangers that we're, we're all concerned about is kids going too fast too soon. And, you know, if you've been sitting around and, and if you're if you're even if you're going to class virtually, you're not walking from classroom to classroom. You're not going through school, you know, and, and doing all of the things from an active standpoint that you were when you actually went to school. And so if you're not getting that and you're staying at home virtually and then but you still get the green light to run out onto the practice field and play, the potential for injury is even greater. And so being able to provide those in that, that information, the, the, um, the lessons as to what to watch for and how to be careful so that it's not so much the rehabilitation after injury, it's to make sure you take care of your body in all aspects so that you don't get injured in the first place. And coming out of the pandemic, I think that's something that every coach has to be watchful of, that we just don't push too hard too soon. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, so I, I've got, this is from Sarah from Lansing, Michigan, and it's for Skip. What is the new U.S. youth soccer program going to look like? What are some of your immediate tasks, and can you give some of the timelines? Sure. Um, I mean, from the top down, we're reimagining everything. That's a, it's a great question, Sarah. Thank you. Um, we're reimagining everything from our national championships to our president's cup. You know, we want to make sure we elevate the current, ele the, the, the current competitions like our state cup championships. Um, so we're looking at how do we do it today and the, and the charge to our staff was if we were building USYS for tomorrow's player today, would we would we look the same as we are right now? And you know, again, with our the, the launch of the university, I think is going to be a, a real strong suit. We're looking at ODP. You know, ODP for me was the pathway to get to my, where my career would go. And the question is, ODP is still a huge program for this organization, but is it truly as relevant as it was years ago? And if it's not, let's make some corrections to make it so, so that all of the players, the coaches, the club directors, the parents all feel the same sense of pride in the ODP jersey as I still do, well, way too many decades past my playing career. Um, but at, at, at any rate, so we're going to be looking at that. You know, over the last few months, we had a tie with the GA, with Major League Soccer, to be able to create that elite platform. You know, so those are some elements that we're going to be looking at. We're going to strengthen the National League. You know, so there's not a stone that we're not, you know, turning to be able to see where we are. And we're also looking at a new competition um, that will literally try to unify the world, if you will. And, and all I will say about it, because the announcement's coming any day, is just think Little League World Series for soccer. Um, so that being said, hope that answered the question, Alan. Oh, I, I believe so. I mean, that's that's great. I, I, I wrote a few notes down and uh, I, I was impressed by the, you changing the vision of US youth soccer and uh, you want players to be a bigger part of the game. Uh, you're looking for passion and commitment, uh, being the best on and off the field. Uh, this needs to be a country that lives and breathes the game. So those all, all are resonating in my brain where I'm going, that's quite a task. And it's, uh, it's going to be enjoyable to, to watch you put it all together and also be part of it. So. Well, thank you. And, and the one thing I will add, and then to, so you can move on in the agenda, you know, we spend an awful lot of time at the very top of the pyramid, you know, and for me, it's all about building the base. The more yeah. kids that we can get into the sport, then the better everybody at the upper end of the of the of the pendulum will will, will sit, and so we're launching. I, I hate the term recreational player, because ninety percent of the time in soccer it's preceded by the word just. Oh, he's just a rec player. She's just a rec player. Well, already we're putting that you're not good enough tag on them because they're not part of that elite 
travel team. And so what that does is there's no reason then for them to stay involved in the game. And so at 13, 15, you know, nine, they leave the sport because they don't think they're good enough. So yep. we're trying to get rid of the rec, that rec tag and we're launching something called League America. And it's gonna be open for all of our state associations and basically any rec league within USYS that just wants to bring that in so that the kids feel like they're a part of something bigger, that they're a part of something. So they're not just a rec player, they're part of League America. And if we do that right, League America will actually be the largest soccer league in the world because we have of our almost 3 million players, only a small percentage or at that real elite competitive ODP, MLS, GA, NW, you know, all at that level. So this would really help us hopefully grow the game. Well, if you're putting League, to Mer League America together, then you're gonna be the, uh, the, 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 the absolute new leader of, uh, of soccer within the youth programs. It's, uh, it's a wonderful project. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Th thank you so much for your insights and uh, and and also the passion that you're you're passing on to the to the game. Thank you so much.